So, yeah, hello everybody. This will be a multidisciplinary talk. So, we'll talk about some geochemistry, some mineral physics, seismology, and, and most of it will be geodynamics. Um, and, uh, well, I'll start very simple. This is a world volcanic and seismic map, and most of the volcanism occurs along the plate boundaries. Uh, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, all of the volcanism? No. For example, uh, Hawaii, there's some, some volcanism over there, and that's interplate volcanism. There's other places like La Réunion um, or Louisville. But I will talk about Hawaii predominantly and why are we interested in inter Why was there an asterisk cartoon there? All volcanism at plate boundaries? No. Oh. It's an <laughs> exception. I didn't, I didn't make the joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let's uh, zoom in on Hawaii. So why are we interested in uh, interplate volcanism and, and plume-related interplate volcanism? So plumes are probes of the lower mantle, and uh, maybe it's not a unique opportunity, but it's a, it's a good opportunity to study uh, the lower mantle, and in the past weeks we have learned why that would be interesting. Um, and the classical plume concept involves uh, a columnar upwelling from the core mantle boundary. Uh, that's the classical theory. Um, that rises to pond beneath the lithosphere. And uh, so for the Pacific plate, which is a fast plate, the ponded material would be, would be sheared into a pancake. And the pancake would be uh, thin and near parabolic in shape. And, uh, Volcanism would, would basically occur at the hot spot, which is at the deflection point of this uh, upwelling into the pancake. And uh, time is color coded in this uh, small animation, so the prediction uh, of uh, hotspot theory would be a linear age distance relationship. Um, yeah, and I already mentioned that the, that the pancake would be uh, predicted to be thin. And uh, at least in the most classical version of uh, plume theory, also to be axisymmetric and uh, steady state, so no, no large variations over time. Um, so the pancake pushes up the lithosphere um, and creates, dynamically supports um, a hotspot swell. So, for example, around, around Hawaii, there's this shallowness of bathymetry and, and and the swell is pushed up by uh, 1 to 1.5 kilometers. So in, yeah, in Hawaii, uh, we think there is a plume because we have vigorous volcanism. We have a long record of this volcanism, uh, more than 80 million years. Um, and the age distance relationship, if you look at all these rocks and some, some of the Empress Seamounts have been dredged, uh, there's a linear age distance relationship and a large uh, s swell that supports uh, the islands. So that's why we think it's a mantle plume. But is it really a classical mantle plume? That's the question here. Uh, so geophysical round one, geophysical evidence versus classical theory. Um, so most of these uh, nice figures here are from, uh, from the uh, plume uh, deployment. So these, these ocean bottom seismometers have been deployed and data has been collected for two years. Um, surface waves, S waves, P waves, and in a, in a cross section 100 kilometer step, there's a fair amount of asymmetry in these images, and there is small scale features which uh, are not really predicted by the most classical version of plume theory. Um, this asymmetry reflects actually in the hot spots well. So if you compare these two sides of the big island, then uh, the swell is uh, significantly shallower. Um, so by, by hundreds of meters on the south uh, western side of the hotspot. And most strikingly, or most in interestingly, um, if we look at a cross section like this in the S-wave images, there is a very thick uh, anomaly um, of slow seismic wave speeds. So uh, there is a lot of uh, slow material there, or maybe the the material is, is very slow. So there's, there's some vertical smearing here. You could try to squeeze this structure into a little bit of a thinner layer, but um, it will be very hard to, sorry? Are, so are we supposed, am I supposed to see asymmetry in the S-waves tomorrow? S-waves also? 
Actually, it's bigger in the S waves because the scale is different. So here is something blue and here is something red, and, and that's the hot spot. Um, and the scale here is, goes to 4%, and here it just goes to 2%. So it's a little bit misleading uh, to show these images next to one another. Actually, the asymmetry shows up better in the S waves than in the P waves. Kevin? Um, dumb question. Where's Loihi? Uh, Loihi is just there. I mean, it's just off of the coast of the big island. It's basically part of the big island. And it will, it will surface in 50,000 years or something. Oh, yeah. So it's going to be part of the big island pretty soon. Wait a little while. <laughs> but so in that S wave, the anomaly, the biggest anomaly is just south of Hawaii. South. Yeah, south or south west, like here or here. Yeah. Uh, um, well, and in the surface waves, yeah, also the biggest anomaly, interestingly, biggest is. Spread is west of the hot spot and, and not at the hot spot, which is re really odd or interesting. You just said something about vertical smearing. So when you, when you show me 100 kilometers, I think, well, maybe there's an influence, a pre-existing influence of the different ages of uh, lithosphere that are above the system. But if I look at the plot on the bottom, it, it goes to, well, the features are really strong to at least 300 kilometers. Yeah, it's like 400, 500 kilometers, yeah. So, well, I'm not looking at the, the, the red, I'm looking more at the, um, at the blue. Yeah. So, so that, that's clearly much deeper than the, than the influence of the lithosphere. That's right, yeah. And um, so to get better constraints on the thickness of this layer, actually a joint tomography of the surface wave and, uh, and the body waves would be good, which, well, which is, has not yet been published. If, if you ask me without showing, without any data, what the what the tomography of Hawaii, Hawaii would look like, I'd say this going to be a big red spot. Like, yeah, well, that's right. But, but, but um, you know about the big blue spot. Yeah, the, uh, the blue spot would be would be a curtain of downwelling, so that would be also predicted by by geodynamic models. But we would expect this red blob not to be as thick. Okay, there is some vertical smearing here. Um, we don't ex know exactly how thick it really is, but uh, the constraints from, from the surface waves, uh, so they give, um, oh, there's no scale here. So they, they give like anomalies of, I don't know, four or 6% and not 10%. So you would need like, if you squeezed all that structure into a thin layer like this, uh, which is predicted from, from the thermal plume paradigm. So you, the plume is only driven by thermal buoyancy classical thermal plume theory, then uh, you, you would end up with a problem in terms of reconciling it with the, with the surface wave. Anyway, uh, the, the oh, let's turn this around. Uh, the, the joint, I, I just, just the other day I got an email from Chang Cheng and, and the joint tomography has been done. So, and uh, I guess, I, I'm not sure how preliminary these results are, but um, they show the same thing. So this is the same data, but another group. And they are looked at the joint tomography. And they uh, see a thickness of this broad body of, of uh, low wave speeds uh, of about uh, 400 kilometers. Then if you, if you look at the, uh, so I mean, we've seen some of Barbara's images, cross sections of her newest model from the um, full waveform tomography. Um, and this is a 3D image. Um, and it shows Hawaii here. So this is the hot spot. So we're looking south. This is like the South Pacific super swell with a couple of hot spots. Um, and Hawaii, the, the Hawaii plume chondrite shows up a little bit differently than uh, in these models. But we also see some evidence for a broad uh, structure over here. Um, and, and these depths are actually also th between 300 and, and 400 kilometer depth. So the different, uh, and, and this is a totally different data set and a totally different method. So uh, these complementary um, group, uh, these com uh, yeah, these complementary methods and different groups uh, have, yeah, have shown the same thing. Um, so uh, round two, uh, volcanic record versus classical theory. Um, if you look at the crustal thickness along the Hawaii Emperor Ridge, you can 
translate that into some kind of a volcanic flux over geological time and there have, have been uh, huge variations in uh, volcanic activity. Apparently there's a dominant period to this, to this uh, yeah, variation which is about 15 or 20 million years. Um, but more importantly is just qualitatively there are variations and these variations are, are quite huge. So like 50% of, of the signal uh, volcanic flux varies by 50% or 100% depending on which reference value you take. Um, <coughs> and another enigmatic observation, so this would be around three patterns of volcanism versus classical theory. Um, just very briefly, volcanism does not only occur at the hot spot, active there's also active volcanism uh, on the older islands uh, so some of you might be familiar with Diamond Head, this uh, vol volcano in, in Waikiki, so Waikiki is just here, uh, is uh, like 100,000 years old or so, so it's basically uh, very, has been active very recently. Um, and there's also uh, recent activity on the flexor arches of uh, Hawaii, um, so there's widespread volcanism around the hotspot, at least low volume volcanism. So these, these are not very, very big volcanoes, but um, they've been actually erupted in one day, most of them, just one eruption. Um, yeah, this is around four, if I counted correctly. The geochemical asymmetry versus classical theory, that might be also familiar to some of you, that uh, Hawaii, at least in the southern part of the chain, consists basically of a double chain and each of the trends has a distinct, a quite distinct geochemical signature. Uh, so uh, in, in many isotope systems, the LOA and the KR trends would actually uh, be, be different. Um, and the preferred model to explain this difference is that uh, there is some bilateral asymmetry in the deep plume, plume stem. Um, it's a quite kind of a simple-minded view, just extrapolating everything back down uh, to, the, to the core mantle boundary, basically. Maybe, maybe there's something to it. I mean, for example, if, if the Hawaiian plume comes off of the side of a LLSVP, um, it's, it's, uh, it's possible that one side of the plume takes different material than the other side of the plume, uh, because this might originate, this material might originate from here and the other might originate from the LRSVP. Um, but it's a speculation at this point and I'll just show that even without um, some, some intrinsic asymmetry in the deep plume stem, we can produce um, geochemical asymmetry in the lavas. I'm not ruling out this possibility, but um, there's, so things are a little bit more complicated. I'll show that later. So just to wrap up these uh, observations, um, which do not comply with the most classical version of plume theory. Uh, so we've talked about the seismic constraints and mo uh, mostly the thick low velocity body and also the overall asymmetry. Um, then the volcanic flux variations were kind of enigmatic. The secondary volcanism, which is widespread. Um, the asymmetry in geochemistry and, and also the asymmetry in the geometry of the swell. So we have a lot of asymmetry in the Hawaiian plume. So that leads to the problem statement. Um, the plume pancake is probably not symmetric and it's also not thin, at least it looks like in the seismic images. And if, if there's these volcanic flux variations, maybe it's also not steady state. So uh, the, the plume paradigm or the, the classical plume theory, the classical, most classical th version of this theory is perhaps too simplistic. Um, so where do we go from here? If we look at such, uh, such a cartoon of, of the mantle and we've seen similar cartoons over the weeks, over the past four weeks, then uh, there might be some, or it looks like we image some uh, fair amount of uh, 
chemical heterogeneity in the deepest earth. And uh, this, these LLSVPs um, should be um, chemically dense. So maybe they consist of eclogite that has been recycled uh, into the lower mantle or of some primordial material. At least this eclogite should come up somewhere and the plumes are a good candidate for um, advecting this material up. And also a heavy material, chemically distinct material from the um, piles uh, should eventually enter into the plumes. So that's why people have started looking at an alternative to simple thermal plumes, which are thermochemical plumes. Uh, and thermochemical convection is more complex than, than purely thermal convection. You may think uh, about, a, about a lava lamp. It's not a perfect analogy, but um, in a lava lamp you have two different fluids, wax and water, and wax is intrinsically heavy and intrinsically dense. Um, so you, you heat the wax, but it doesn't rise because it's still denser than the cool water around. Um, so you have to actually heat it more and then you start you start to form plumes, but the, I mean, looking at a lava lamp essentially never gets boring because these upwellings are very, yeah, very crazy and very complex. And the same, so this is a time series here, same for some chemical plumes, this is lab work, and I think we've seen these images before in another lecture. Uh, these are numerical uh, predictions of a thermochemical plume and also these uh, are fairly um, complex here. In this case, the, the 660 uh, discontinuity plays an important role. Well, the bottom line is some chemical plumes are intrinsically dense and they can be uh, complex in behavior and, and also fat um, because of that additional uh, chemical buoyancy. And mafic lithologies such as eclogite, which has been uh, recycled into the um, low mantle are good candidates uh, for this, for this uh, chemically distinct material. Maxime, when yeah. you said chemical, you mean compositional? Yes. Okay. That's just the, that's the term of art in the field? Thermochemical plumes, yeah, that's the term of art. Curious. Okay. <laughs> yeah. In, in contrast to the thermal plume, which is just a thermal upwelling. Yeah. Well, um, for Hawaii in particular, there is uh, good evidence for for mafic um, materials in the in the source. So, for example, if we look at this plot from Hertzberg, uh, there so purely peritetic partial melts should fall. I guess this is a simplistic view, and, and some of you uh, can basically correct me. I guess, but. Um, Purely peritetic partial melts should fall in this uh, black field. And um, it's, I think, at least at high pressures, it's hard to cross this thermal divide here, this like, boundary. So the, the Hawaiian melts, which, are mo which pl plot mostly on the other side of the thermal divide, they should have at least some contribution of um, mafic melting. Um, in the source. So at shallow depth, these, these melts are free to mix. Um, but this is an indication that um, pyroxenide partial melting or eclogetic melting plays an important role in, in Hawaiian volcanism. Uh, there's another line of, of uh, reasoning, and that's based on um, uh, major and minor elements in, in olivine phenocryse. So that's work of, of Sobolev uh, and, and others. Um, and these are also indicative for, for some contribution of uh, pyroxenite in the source, um, and even more so in the lower side of the chain than the Kea side. Um, they have tried to, to put numbers, uh, so um, with osmium isotopes and, and strontium isotopes. Yeah, I'm not sure how much you can believe this, but there's like yeah, maybe a 50-50 uh, contribution of pyroxenite versus um, peritite in the source of Hawaiian lavas. What's that zero in there? This one? 
uh, I guess this would be zero percent. No, this would be zero percent pyroxenite and hundred percent peridotite, and that's a mixing hyperbola. Oh, oh, I don't know. You should know more. No, should know more about this than I. Uh, So um, I think the the way that that they are um, envisioning um, mental metasomatism and melting to be happening beneath a hot spot is that there, if there's a thermal chemical plume that consists um, of, uh, of 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 eclogite and and peridotite and and this welds up um, at some point the eclogite starts melting um, and the, the eclogitic melts uh, are not stable in a, in a matrix of peridotite, uh, basically due to the thermal divide that I was showing you in the, in the former plot. And then uh, mental metasomatism would, would uh, create um, pyroxenite. So this is a hybrid lithology, or supposed to be a hybrid, hybrid lithology from eclogite melting and peridotite. So what you end up, up with is something like this. Um, so in my model, this is implemented. So I start with 15% eclogite, and some of this uh, remains as a refractory eclogite. Most of it transforms into pyroxenite um, together, and, and thereby consumes some of the some of the peridotite. Um, and this, uh, if you. Uh, take this material, this uh, heterogeneous material, which consists of three different lithologies, and, and start to melt it. Then the peroxenite will preferentially melt because it has a different melting behavior than the peridotite. So this plot shows the melt productivity uh, versus pressure, and peroxenite has a huge melt productivity. So even if it's only in this case 18% or even even less um, of uh, of the material in the plume, it will have a huge uh, a huge impact on melting. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the solidity can be depressed by volatiles in, in, in these peridotitic lithologies, but uh, volatiles would, would also tend to decrease the melt productivity quite a bit. Um, so yeah. Why do you need 20% hydrous peridotite instead of all dry peridotite? I use different, uh, different flavors of peridotite to match the, the rheology in the uh, in the plume. So this is basically important uh, for for the swell. That the swell looks realistic, and um, yeah, in a previous well, in a previous study, it was also important to control um, where secondary volcanism would occur. So this this type of widespread volcanism basically it controls how how fast the uh, oh, um, oh, yeah. The, basically, controls how, how strongly the, the um, plume curves around the corner. Because uh, if you melt this hydrolithology, then you take out water of the system, and that affects your rheology. And this hydrospheritite is presumably just fractionally so that's, that's right. Yeah, it's just like two, <coughs> like 100 or 200 ppm. I don't. And usually, I take like. Or three, maybe 300 ppm water, yeah. I think it's 300 ppm. Okay, so this is our hypothesis. This is a cartoon. We actually drew this cartoon before we started the calculations, or a very similar cartoon. So we're envisioning this uh, thermochemical plume to come up, and then at some point the plume will encounter phase changes. So and the phase changes have a um, have an important effect, and now please, mineral physicists, wake up! Oh, <laughs> mineral physics alarm! <laughs> so, uh, so eclogite. So there's 15% eclogite in the plume, and eclogite is always in the upper mantle at least. It's always denser than uh, peridotite, and even more so between these two uh, phase transitions. So this will have an important effect on the dynamics. So a plume that welds up with 15% eclogite. Will, will be neutrally buoyant or even slightly negatively buoyant um, in this depth range. So maybe the, the, poo, the plume will pool into a layer um, before it rises further, and then ectojet will be kind of 
removed by melting and, and uh, the plume will become more buoyant and more narrow therefore. So it used to be a fat plume and then this is more well behaved thin plume. So this is the concept and uh, this is uh, the result from, from the geodynamic model and it looks fairly, fairly similar. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is not quite the base of the model, so the base of the model is a little bit deeper at the 660 discontinuity. Um, but uh, so most of the plume is eclogitic, it has 15% uh, of eclogite, therefore there's this shading here that reflects the, uh, the compositional density anomaly basically. And then here is the, the two phase changes and where the compositional density anomaly is strongest, you form uh, this deep exergetic pool there. And eventually you form secondary upwellings uh, out of this pool. Does that have the solidus for the phase change to go from eclogite uh, back when you remount eclogite to get, get more buoyancy back? Yeah, yeah. If you if you melt eclogite and basically transform it into pyroxenite, which which uh, happens at about this depth here or so this depth do. range here, um, you you gain the buoyancy back. So that's why this basically is not shaded and it's shaded here. So first of all, you 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 get the buoyancy back that you lost at at this phase change. You, you gain it back immediately. And then over a depth range, you, you gain even more back because you remove eclogite by partial melting. So isn't, isn't like your depth there is 90 kilometers and it's, what's the melting depth for eclogite? It's like, it's like 250 to 200 kilometers. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is the loss of garnet from the system. Garnet, okay. Yeah, from, on the subsolid spaces, that's not happening until the top of the system. But I think what Maxim is doing is, is he's just losing eclogen because it's preferentially melting. So he's, he's the whole system is becoming more positive in a way. Not because of intrinsic density of the eclogen, but, the, but just that there's less of it in the solid. Yeah. Yeah, the eclogite um, is removed at the expense of pyroxenite, and pyroxenite is assumed to be neutrally buoyant. <clears throat> Yeah, and the white stuff up here is the hard school guide which forms due to melting. Uh, yeah, and that's in where the plume. just right side, no matter what. That's pretty shallow. Yeah, that's shallow. That's the shallow. So we still get the shallow kind of almost near pla near classical pancake here, but we have this additional layer. So we have a double layering uh, predicted from from this uh, model. Um, so yeah, this is just again the cartoon for for what we've just actually been been talking about. Uh, and, uh, and the 3D representation showing, showing isosurfaces of temperature. If, if we were to zoom in on this model, yeah. you know, for each uh, node or each point, is, are, are, there, are there discrete blobs of different lithologies or does each point just have an average? There's different tracers. Each, each of these tracers has an average. Mm -hmm. So it's not po the code would not be possible to completely separate exergite um, from so questions about what the length scale of the eclogite pods are and their buoyancy within the plume yeah. can't be addressed with this. Well, that, that assumes basically that this length scale here is somewhere between one meter or one centimeter yeah, two, and a two kilometer two. or 100 meter, maximum 100 meter, something like that. Because I'm, I'm sure you appreciate it, but if the eclogite pods are sufficiently large, then they just start falling through the plume, right? I guess so, yeah. Yeah. That, that cannot be addressed with this model. Um, so the, the deep exergetic pool, here again another cartoon, is basically slightly negatively buoyant. So it's, a, it's actually a dense exergetic pool. And um, so this pool would like to fall back into the mantle, but it's kind of being supported by the plume stem below and also by the uh, non exergetic <coughs> outskirts of the plume. So maybe go back here. So the outskirts of the plume here are still warm, but they don't contain any eclogite in this model. So they kind of, those are the fingers here that, that support the, the deep eclogitic pool. Um, and eventually it's also being dragged by the, by the thermal plume at the top. So eventually 
or let's let's look at it from from bottom up. So eventually, uh, the supported pool will will be continue to be fed from below and eventually cross this phase change here, this magic line, and regain its positive net buoyancy to yeah to form this nice uh, nice plume uh, shallow plume on top. And um, I will look at two different models. This is model one with um, uh, with a given radius here for this uh, compositional anomaly, with it, which is 90 kilometer. And in, in model two, it will be 100 kilometer. So there's not a big difference in these two models, but we'll see the dynamics are quite quite astonishingly different. Thanks. Yeah? Can you go back to slide? Yeah? What's causing that deep epigenetic pool to not spread out and not cross that boundary at all instead of your, it getting it sort of narrow and being able to cross? Yeah, it spreads out a little bit. So it's like maybe 200 kilometers wide and 400 kilometers long. Um, but yeah, uh, so your question, the, the answer to your question is that these uh, fingers of, of outskirt material are kind of constraining the, the plume, or confining the plume from, from the sides and don't allow it to, to spread um, in, indefinitely uh, because they are forced to rise around the deep extra. Some of this material is lost in, in this kind of uh, depth range and um, maybe if I go back, you can see one of these blobs. Yeah, this is a, actually a lost blob. And it will be, some of, sometimes material is lost here and will eventually settle at this uh, um, phase transition, like an upside down iceberg. So yeah, these are the two models, 90 and 100 kilometers, so no big difference. Model one, model two, which I'll be looking at. And, and I'll also show a reference model, uh, a thermal plume, model zero. So this is model zero, um, and uh, it has some, some compl complications in it. There is some small, small scale convection developing in the plume due to highly temperature dependent uh, rheology, and this small scale convection creates volcanism on the flanks of the pancake. Uh, but most of the volcanism occurs here, and there's some, some volcanism there. Um, and there's also small scale convection in the ambient mantle, like these uh, rictorols. So this is a thermal boundary layer instability at the base of the thickening oceanic lithosphere. And there is some interaction between the plume and this, uh, this small scale convection. Uh, I will show, or I'll not go terribly much into detail here, but um, I will show some implications of that. So the, this interaction is, is interesting by itself. For, for model zero, but uh, more interesting, yeah, model one, we already saw it uh, in, the, in the picture, this is, this is a movie. And in, in model two, um, it looks fairly uh, time dependent. So in this case, um, the volume of ecclogitic material is a little bit bigger and the uh, net buoyancy of this deep ecclogitic pool is higher. So um, it really would like to think, uh, to sink back in, into the transition zone. Um, and the, and the, like, the positive feedback mechanisms at the top of, so at 300 kilometers, they create this pulsing behavior. So whenever material is released uh, from the deep ecclogitic plume pool, it falls back. Um, maybe you can get a fairly good um, intuition for, for this mechanism just by looking at it. But it's basically the positive feedback mechanisms related to the phase change itself and also related to ecclogite melting, which create, uh, create this behavior. And, and what we see here in black is just melting of pyroxenite and prototypes of the ecclogite melting is a little bit deeper. <clears throat> Um, so the model one was also asymmetric if you look at a cross section going out of the plane, but this model in, um, at a given snapshot can be very asymmetric uh, and that has implications, uh, which I will show here. For example, for the geochemical um, non-symmetry, Uh, 
um, we have we have yeah looked at these observations here, geochemical asymmetry and also the asymmetry in seismic wave speeds at a given depth. Um, and this is uh, the prediction of model two for, for a snapshot in time. And the color code here is uh, the pyroxenite contribution in volcanism. So basically on, on this side of the hotspot, so this is the hotspot here, the contours reflect the amount uh, of uh, volcanism. On this side of the hotspot there is uh, the, the colors are more, yeah, they're warm, are warmer than on the other side of the hotspot. So this has a lower uh, pyroxenite contribution volcanism than, than this side. So this could address some of, some of these differences qualitatively. Um, and if we, if we play this, then you get a sense for how time dependent it is. Um, so actually the, the hotspot moves around a little bit, it wobbles by 50 kilometers or so. This is, the wobble is not sufficient to basically violate the constraint of a linear age distance relationship. Um, but it's, it's an interesting uh, prediction of this particular model. Does that have crust thickness uh, predicted or it would be melting? Yeah, yeah. So the contours are, I'm not quite sure in this particular plot here, um, how the can contours are arranged, but the, I, I, well, the contours are the, uh, the rate of volcanism. For, yeah. <clears throat> so you can create crustal thickness in that. And this one, your, your reference tool is completely steady, right? Yes, the bottom boundary condition is completely steady. So this time dependence completely arises from, from the dynamics within the deep ecclesiastic pool. It's basically because this uh, deep ecclesiastic pool is, is so matter stable um, that that any small um, perturbation. So actually, here there is some some uh, small scale convection interacting with the with the plume. So this uh, pushes uh, the DEP a little bit to the other side. But that's just a weak, relatively weak uh, perturbation. It wouldn't be able um, to influence a simple thermal plume by very much, but uh, such a thermochemical plume uh, is sensitive uh, to, to any perturbation, or also mantle heterogeneity, or ambient like flow, like mantle wind. So it would be very a very sensitive plume. Um, so this is model zero again. Model zero. Uh, also shows a little bit of a symmetry, but it's uh, much more subtle. So here the, the color scale is different and uh, uh, the asymmetry is uh, more subtle. So you can get like a 5% difference in, in pyroxenite di distribution between the different sides. Um, but you can get something. Um, and you can also predict some, some geochemical difference actually between these, like the secondary volcanism ha happening away from the hotspot and the, the shield stage volcanism happening at the hotspot. Um, but uh, I would like to make this point, which is maybe more important here. So from the plume that I was just showing in the movie, which showed these nice pulsations, uh, the prediction in terms of volcanic flux over time would be the blue line here on model two. So there is a fair amount of uh, variation um, and the observations are in the gray, gray line. Well, it's not really an observation, it's a, also a model based on the observations. But if we believe this model, then um, our, our predictions uh, in terms of the numerical model uh, do well in, in matching the amplitudes, but do not so well in matching, matching the periods uh, or wavelength of, of, of this um, von Aachen Lind curve. Um, well, I guess the, the, we haven't done a lot of different models in this uh, respect, but I expect that the rheology will, so that the wavelength here will be sensitive to the rheology. Model one would be almost a flat line. Model zero would be also a flat line. And uh, somewhere in this uh, range, it depends a little bit where you put the small scale convection. Uh, so you can, you can basically move the, if this is the plume, 
and this is small scale convection. You can basically move the small scale convection relative to the plume. This will change uh, your uh, flux by a little bit, but only by 25% and not by basically 100% uh, as, in, uh, as in these curves. <coughs> so now we compare this, uh, the numerical models with seismic models. So this would be a synthetic seismogram, a synthetic seismic image from um, model one. And uh, if we do a resolution test using the plume data set, oh, yeah, first of all, I would just, yeah, this is the synthetic, this is the observations, and uh, yeah, these are horizontal cross sections, but uh, let's just look at this other model, um, which, which I showed, uh, for the joint tomography. So, the, so these two are showing a similar cross-section, uh, and this one as well. Um, and this synthet synthetic seismic image would blur out into something like this if you did a, a resolution test due to, yeah, due to the smearing that is inherent uh, to the inversion. Um, it looks somewhat similar to Cicely's image and I think it also looks uh, similar to um, Cheng's image. Um, if you go back, Cheng's image, maybe if you, well, if you believe their structures, you can almost see this double layering. So this is at, at like 300 to 400 kilometers, the second layer, and this is actually 400 kilometers here. But it's maybe a little bit in, over-interpreting this image. Anyway, the main point on this slide is if you take model zero, which is basically a more or less classical plume, um, and, and model one and compare both to, to Cecily's image or to Chang's image, then I think uh, model one does a better job in, in, in matching uh, the observations. Um, and also, there's, more, there's a slightly more quantitative way of looking at this by looking at the mean station delay times. And, and um, th this model does twice as good of a job as this model to matching the mean station delay times. Okay, just for the secondary volcanism, if you remember, there, I just briefly walk through this. This is maybe not the most important constraint. Um, secondary volcanism, volcanism doesn't only occur at the, at the hotspot, but also away from the hotspot. So those are basically these, those could be related to these predictions of the model. There's widespread volcanism and uh, also the volume matches uh, by the order of magnitude. But also, oh no, I turned it around. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, this is the model zero. Also for the model zero we get, we actually get quite a nice fit even in the geographical locations uh, of these uh, predicted secondary vul volcanism. So this is not a good uh, observation to distinguish between a classical and a non-classical plume. So let's wrap, wrap up. So for model zero, uh, we didn't do very well in matching, so if this is a yellow or an orange here, we didn't do very well in matching the, uh, or in explaining the volcanic flux variations that have been recorded over geological time. We did fairly well in explaining the secondary volcanism, as you just saw. <clears throat> For the geochemical, there's some uh, symmetry predicted from, from model zero, but it's, it's, it's fairly small, and uh, we haven't really tested quantitatively whether we can really, uh, yeah, explain the the the, um, yeah, the characteristics in terms of the different isotopes and whatnot for the different chains. Uh, so qualitatively, yes. Quantitatively, no. So this is a yellow. And seismic constraint, this thick body, uh, we cannot really. Um, predict that from, from model zero, which is a thermal plume that interacts with small scale convection. The thermal chemical plume models one and two, uh, we can explain the volcanic flux variations very well, and also the secondary volcanism. In terms of the geochemical symmetry, same thing. We predict qualitatively, we do predict the symmetry, but I have not demonstrated that we can quantitatively match the data. and. 
in terms of the seismic constraints, I hope I uh, convinced you that, um, yeah, so far this is the best model to uh, explain this is, this uh, uh, observations uh, that, that recently came up. Um, so this is the conclusion. Thermochemical plumes that comprise about 15% of eclogite are predicted to pool in a deep eclogitic pool and to form this double layering of, of hot material, um, which can explain uh, the thickness of the low velocity body beneath uh, the Hawaiian hotspot. And uh, can, uh, so the dynamics in the deep eclogitic pool can also give rise to geochemical asymmetry of hotspot volcanism um, without putting any heterogeneity, so this relates to, to Mark's question, uh, at, at the bottom, so basically in the, in the lower mantle, at the bottom of this model. <clears throat> and yeah, it can also account for the volcanic flux variations. Um, so the, the inherent pulsing of the plume, again, is independent uh, on, on the lower mantle. There might, that might be additional pulsing uh, or additional flux variations that come from the lower mantle, and there might be additional asymmetry that comes from the lower mantle. That's not anything I rule out here, uh, but I'm just demonstrating that this can arise entirely from the dynamics uh, of, of the deep eclogitic pool. So the take home messages is, yeah. I'm not fat, yeah, that's always what Obelix says, but nobody believes him. So maybe he's also double layered um, and, and not, well, this, this point basically makes the point that, uh, so this is a study that has geared, that has been, was geared uh, towards Hawaii and we would have to look at each hotspot individually. Um, so this, I'm not saying like every hotspot is a thermochemical plume um, and actually if you vary this eclogite content uh, by a couple of percent, you and I, I demonstrated it by showing showing these these two cases, model one and model two, which are fairly similar. So um, what I'm saying is that that there is a, uh, different regimes of thermochemical plume essence, and every plume might, might look a little bit different from the other plume. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay, questions? Back in ancient petrologic history, before eclogite became fashionable in, in plumes, there was the widespread belief that the Hawaiian source was just more iron rich than normal, say, mid ocean basalt source. Mm. More iron rich just in the sense of peridotite with a larger amount of iron. And it would have some of the properties of your eclogite in, in your model in the sense that it would be intrinsically more dense but also intrinsically more fertile. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think that that idea is completely dead, but it's a little bit less fashionable. It seems like it would work, right? You could, you could just tune this plume to have a range of lithologies from normal period type to some of more iron rich period type. Mm. And it would have some of the same behavior. Yeah, the behavior basically depends on the um, on the density contrast, but also on these phase transitions. And the upper two of the phase transitions is basically a phase transition in quartz. So I'm invoking a a eclogite with free SiO2. So um, yeah, that that subtlety wouldn't exist in the yeah. And but I'm just wondering, yes. The essential thing is more dense but more fertile. Yeah, yeah, that's the essential thing. Yeah, and I mean I'm not a petrologist, but would would the uh, iron-rich prototype be consistent with the osmium data for for Hawaii? The osmium rate. Possibly not. About the plumes beneath Hawaii, I think there was some evidence from seismology which used the PP precursors. It shows that the uh, uh, mantle transition into the bending was now right beneath the island. It's mm. a little bit shifted to the west. That's right, yeah. Hundred kilometers. That's the Zhao and Thunderhills uh, 
paper. Uh, oh, and I think, oh, uh, but in your the simulation is, seems like a straight plume, right? It's almost like a straight plume, yeah. And uh, I think there's a there's a discussion in the seismological community whether whether the the paper that you're referring to is um, science paper, not it's robust. Yeah, yeah, it's a science paper. Jin Jin Zhao and and Rob van der Holtz and others. Um, there's a few um, issues with that paper, I think. <laughs> well, this is recorded. <laughs> Should I turn it off? No. Uh, I think what I heard, if I remember cor correctly, from, from from other seismologists, is that it's um, it's kind of odd in their paper that the, that the 660 shows such a uh, strong topography, and the no, that the 520 actually shows a stronger topography than the 660. Mm -hmm. And another issue is that um, it's they see such a big feature that. Uh, it should have also shown up in, in other studies that used the same or similar techniques. Mm -hmm. They used a, another technique in that, um, well, the, the binning of the bounce points, uh, they, they used other ways of doing that, and this uh, is, was done to make, to make the um, method more accurate, but, um, well, at least there, is, uh, there are some seismologists that don't believe that it's robust. Oh, but oh, forget the reliability of that paper. Is it possible that the plume will be banned near the transition balloon? It's possible. Um, the, there is actually a paper out last year, um, so a geodynamic paper, which which gets plumes to bend. Okay. So that's uh, bend shaped plumes, uh, something, and that's uh, Tosi and Yuan in, in EPSL, I think. Um, but. Uh, I, I showed you uh, the three different seismic models, right? And I think they were fairly consistent. Um, so I was pretty excited about that, actually, because I mean, of course, the whole story would a little not maybe not the whole story, uh, but uh, some of the story would crumble apart if if the next model would not show this big feature anymore, but uh, here we are, here we see three different uh, models and this is a completely different data set and they, they all show a thick blob at the relevant depth. I wonder if a double layer plume would be an easier way to explain some of the non-age progressive hotspots, like the Azores for example. I'm not familiar with the age progression in the Azores. There is none. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you can, you can explain some age, lack of age progression or complicated age patterns better. I mean, some of these models, for example, show, um, let me see. Uh, put up one of these images and then it's easier. Some of these models show this shallow plume to be traveling like from here to here and then jumping back. And that wouldn't be a linear age distance relationship anymore. And um, just looking at, at also earlier studies on thermochemical convection, in, in thermochemical plumes, just as I mentioned, it's like, like in, the, in the lava lamp, everything is more complicated. So. I, I, I can imagine other regimes of thermochemical plumes which show even more complex behavior. Then. My memory may be out of date in the plume uh, literature, but the old, old conventional wisdom uh, about the bend in the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain uh, being due to a change in Pacific plate relative to a fixed hotspot frame. Is that still conventional wisdom, or is that been revised? Well, there is a, the, the latest paper on that uh, is from Terduno and others, and they invoke uh, southward motion of the hotspot before the kink, and then no southward motion anymore. Um, it's, it's based on some, some paleo latitude uh, yeah, data. Is the 
the height of the topographic swell above a, a plume or hot spot um, is just related to the buoyancy flux. So you can't. So it's non-unique in terms of figuring out um, whether it's a thermochemical plume or not, because you would just trade off mantle potential temperature with uh, compositional uh, buoyancy. In this case, um, the buoyancy flux in the lower part of the plume would be relatively small because you have the compositional anomaly, but then you remove the exergite here and you, this pancake still generates a sizable, sizable swell. And um, this pool down here is almost neutrally buoyant, so it wouldn't have an effect on the, on the geoid. Um, it's near neutrally buoyant. So it's, I, I don't think you can distinguish this plume from a thermal plume uh, readily. Does, it, from does the reference model have a higher potential temperature and then predict different melting? No, actually. Uh, this has a, uh, has a bigger radius of the thermal anomaly uh, to be able to, to pick this material up has the same reference temperature, uh, but then eventually the radius will will be similar in the shallow, so this model will, will have a similar radius than the other thin classical model in its shallow part. The, uh, the, the code predicts a swell, and the swell in these models has about the right dimensions, uh, more so for model one than for model two. Um, for model two, it's a little bit small um, because I put more eclogite in there. Um, interestingly, the, the swell is asymmetric. Um, I don't have an image, but it is, it is quite asymmetric, like, like observed. Is there, does, is the existence of a pool sens sensitive to the potential difference, potential temperature difference across the... Like yeah, if you, if you make the plume hotter, you basically have to increase the, the exergite okay. content to get, still get the, a similar behavior. Um, and the, the Hawaiian plume might be the only plume that is so hot to actually pick up so much exergite. Other plumes that wouldn't be able to just carry enough exergite um, to, to this depth. Uh, so that's a little bit the way I see it. So Hawaii might be also in, unique in showing this uh, double layer, uh, double layering. Uh, maybe not in the double layering, but at least unique in the in in being carrying so much extra Training dense material from the bottom. Yeah. So it depends on the buoyancy flux and the, and the, the rays, the conduit. It depends on the thermal buoyancy flux. Yes. Yeah, but I didn't. Your question was whether I varied like the temperature between the different models, and I didn't. I varied the radius um, to increase the thermal buoyancy flux and be able to carry this compositional material. And then eventually, oh, and then eventually the radius. I think Muhammad had a question. Yeah, I was just wondering about changing size of the model if this is a result of a joint inversion uh, for surface and body weight model. Because it has a shallower. Uh, so this is a joint inversion, but I don't really know much about this model. It's not published, or it's, this, this is going to be discussed at AGU. So AGU abstract submitted. Because the, the lower one is, I guess, this is finite frequency model. Yeah. Which has like deeper, right. deeper phase. It has a, yeah, but it's also. Actually, Cheng Cheng also showed me an image for a pure S-wave in inversion, and it looks very similar to this one. Um, uh, Cecily, I think, mentioned that that her results don't depend very much on whether she uses ray theory or, or finite frequency uh, theory. Um, and it's yeah, you have a better depth constraint by by including the surface waves. Again, I don't know very much about the model, but if I believe this image, just like this. Then, yeah, I would, I would, I guess, I would just trust this uh, depth more than than this depth here, because 
at least theoretically, conceptually, the, the smearing should be less in a, in a joint inversion. Yeah, particularly in this depth range, the, the vertical resolution uh, is relatively poor if you look at body weights alone.